China's Shenzhou-12 mission launched on June 17 from Jiaquan Satellite Launch Center in northwest China, rising off the pad atop a long March 2F rocket. Shenzhou-12 or Divine Vessel is China's first crewed spaceflight in nearly five years, sending three astronauts to Tianhe, the core module of the nation's new Tiangong space station. The mission is commanded by astronaut Nai Haixing and is accompanied by astronauts Liu Boming and Tang Hongbo. The Long March 2F rocket that carried the astronauts is a two-stage vehicle with four strap-on boosters. The 62 meters tall rocket is fueled by nitrogen tetroxide and unsymmetrical dimethyl hydrazine. The vehicle is also equipped with a Soyuz-style fairing with grid fins and a solid-fueled escape motor on top to ensure that the crew can escape a failing booster. The Shenzhou spacecraft was approved in 1992 as part of the Chinese Human Spaceflight Initiative and has a design layout very similar to the Russian Soyuz spacecraft. The front of the spacecraft contains an androgynous docking ring used to dock to the Tiangong space module, which is compatible with the original Russian docking technology installed on the ISS for docking with the space shuttle. The descent module containing the crew is a scaled-up version of the Soyuz descent module, with a very similar mold line. The rear of the spacecraft is a service module equipped with engines, fuel tanks, and solar panels. About six and a half hours after liftoff, the spacecraft docked into one of the four docking ports of China's space station module, marking the first crewed visit to the facility. Three hours later, the crew entered the Tianhe core module, marking the first time astronauts have entered the Jiangong space station. The primary objective for the crew is to bring the 22.5-ton Tianhe module into service. They will carry out tasks such as the mechanical arm operation and extravehicular activities and verify a series of key technologies. Two spacewalks are planned to occur during the crew's approximately three-month stay in orbit. The crewed mission is the third of 11 launches planned for the construction of the Jiangong space station, expected to be complete by the end of 2022. Watch our previous updates to learn more about this 100-ton Chinese space station. Link in the description. SpaceX successfully launched an advanced GPS satellite for the U.S. Space Force on Thursday, marking the 19th launch of the year. The Falcon 9 rocket lifted off from Space Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral on June 17, carrying the Lockheed Martin-built GPS-3 Space Vehicle 5 satellite. This is the fifth satellite of the GPS-3 constellation that provides positioning, navigation, and timing signals to military and civilian users. Including Thursday's mission, SpaceX has launched 67 reused boosters with a flawless success record since March 2017. But Thursday's launch was the first time military officials entrusted a high-priority national security payload with a right on a previously flown Falcon 9 rocket. The booster, designated B1062, was previously recovered on November 5 after the launch of GPS-3 Space Vehicle 4. The rocket's first stage separated from the second stage approximately 2 minutes and 40 seconds after liftoff and touched down on a drone ship off the coast of Florida in the Atlantic Ocean. After two-second stage engine burns, the GPS satellite separated approximately 1 hour and 29 minutes after liftoff. Over the next one to two weeks, the satellite will use its orbit raising engine to maneuver into a 20,000 km high, 55 degrees inclined circular medium Earth orbit. The satellite will join the constellation of 31 spacecraft that operates in a semi-synchronous orbit in six orbital planes. Built by Lockheed Martin, the GPS-3 SV-05 satellite, named after Neil Armstrong, is the fifth member of an upgraded generation of GPS navigation spacecraft that is destined to replace a nearly 17-year-old GPS satellite. The satellite is designed to beam down higher power signals that are more resilient to jamming and boast additional broadcast frequencies to make the GPS network more compatible with other similar constellations. The U.S. military plans to launch a total of 10 upgraded GPS satellites as part of an effort to replace aging members of its current constellation. The next two GPS missions are already scheduled to fly on SpaceX rockets sometime next year. Betelgeuse is one of the brightest and best-known stars in the sky, which is 642 light-years away from Earth. In December 2019, this giant star began dimming dramatically, and by mid-February 2020, the star had plummeted to about 35% of its typical brightness. Betelgeuse, which forms the shoulder of the constellation Orion, is a bloated red supergiant star that will die in a violent supernova explosion in the relatively near future. So, some astronomers speculated that this great dimming might be the beginning of Betelgeuse's death throes and that the star could soon explode violently. But that didn't happen, and Betelgeuse bounced back to its expected brightness levels by April 2020. Astronomers suggested at the time that perhaps Betelgeuse simply experienced a transient cooling episode or maybe its light was temporarily blocked by a cloud of dust. 
Now, a year after Beetlejuice's recovery from what has become known as its great dimming, a recent study published on June 16 in Nature presents a compelling explanation for this strange behavior. Researchers led by Miguel Monterges, an astrophysicist at the Paris Observatory, studied Betelgeuse before and during the Great Dimming, using multiple instruments installed at the European Southern Observatory's Very Large Telescope. Together, the datasets suggest that sometime before astronomers started noticing the dimming, Betelgeuse ejected a huge cloud of gas. Then, in December 2019, convective cooling in the star's atmosphere and its regular pulsations dropped the temperature in the cloud's surroundings, allowing much of the gas to condense quickly into dust, and this dust blocked much of Betelgeuse's light as seen from Earth. The conclusion from the modeling is that both the transient cooling episode and blockage of light by a cloud of dust happened at the same time, leading to the great dimming. The results confirm that the great dimming is not an indication of Betelgeuse's imminent explosion, and the study lays the groundwork for unraveling the properties of an entire population of stars. NASA's Hubble Space Telescope, which has been in space for more than 30 years and made countless discoveries, stopped working because of an issue with a computer that controls its science instruments. NASA said on June 16 that the telescope, which launched into low Earth orbit in 1990, has stopped all astronomical viewing. The computer halted on Sunday, June 13, and an attempt to restart the computer failed on Monday, June 14. After analyzing the data, the Hubble operations team suggested that the anomaly could be because of a degrading memory module inside the onboard computer. The operations team attempted to switch to a backup memory module on Wednesday, however the command to initiate the backup module failed to complete. Another attempt was conducted on both modules on Thursday evening to obtain more diagnostic information, while again trying to bring those memory modules online. However, those attempts were also not successful. The payload computer is a NASA standard spacecraft computer system built in the 1980s that is located on the Science Instrument Command and Data Handling Unit. The computer's purpose is to control and coordinate the science instruments and monitor them for health and safety purposes. In an update on June 18, NASA mentioned that they continue to work on resolving the issue, and the operations team will be running tests and collecting more information on the system to further isolate the problem. NASA confirmed that the telescope itself and science instruments are in good health and they will remain in a safe mode state until this issue is resolved. Assuming that the present problem is corrected via one of the many options available to the operations team, Hubble is expected to continue yielding amazing discoveries into the late 2020s or beyond. Now, let's discuss some of the major Starship updates from the past week. On June 17, SpaceX conducted the second cryo-proof test of Super Heavy Test Tank Booster BN 2.1. Similar to the first cryo-proof test that happened on June 8, the second test involved pressurizing the stainless steel test tank with cryogenic liquid nitrogen and simultaneously pressing the aft section of the tank with nine hydraulic rams to simulate the thrust generated by nine inner engines of the booster. Thursday's test lasted for about five hours. These kinds of tests help engineers assess the tank's structural strength and provides them with insight to know whether the tank's construction technique and design need improvement. It's unclear whether SpaceX will conduct a third cryo-proof test in the coming weeks or they will perform a pressure test to failure which involves pressurizing the tank with cryogenic nitrogen until it bursts or leaks. Construction of the orbital launch tower is now more than half complete. The fourth segment of the launch tower which got rolled out to the launch site on June 9 got installed atop the third segment on June 13. The Lieber LR11350 crawler crane, nicknamed Kong, lifted the segment and gently lowered it over the previously assembled launch tower sections. Workers standing on the four corner scaffolds secured the segment before the crane got retracted. Three days later, on June 16, the fifth segment of the launcher tower got installed on top of the fourth segment. The launch tower basement has a height of 12 meters and the first tower segment is 20 meters tall. All subsequent segments have a height of 18 meters. Therefore, currently, the launch tower is 104 meters high. On March 19, Elon Musk tweeted that the launch tower will have a hook height of at least 140 meters when configured to mate Starship to Super Heavy. And according to an April 2021 FAA filing, SpaceX is planning to build a 469-foot tall steel launch tower with a 10-foot lightning rod. This means that SpaceX will most likely stack two more tower segments each of height 18 meters on top of the existing structure, followed by a 3-meter concrete roof. A lightning rod of 10 meters will go on top of the roof. The sixth prefabricated section of the orbital launch tower has already been finished and delivered to the launch site and will likely be installed on the tower within a few days. Meanwhile, 
The seventh segment construction has already begun at the build site, meaning that the launch tower assembly could easily be completed before the end of the month. SpaceX will still have to outfit the tower with an unproven custom-built mechanism meant to catch super-heavy boosters, but Starship's inaugural orbital flight test campaign does not appear to be contingent on that mechanism. The tower's main purpose will be to support a crane capable of stacking Starships on super-heavy boosters, as well as some kind of stabilization mechanism to make that delicate process slightly more viable in unfavorable weather. On June 16, SpaceX technicians rolled Starship SN16 out of the Boca Chica factory's high bay to a nearby display stand. The prototype joined Starship serial number 15, which is resting on its display stand at the scrapyard since May 26. In response to a Teslarati report on Starship SN16's apparent transport, SpaceX CEO Elon Musk says that the vehicle may still have a shot at flight. According to him, SpaceX might use SN16 on a hypersonic flight test. Till now no Starship has traveled faster than a few hundred kilometers per hour during ascent. SpaceX's high-altitude three-engine prototypes appeared to reach their peak velocities while in an unpowered freefall after a powered flight. Musk's use of hypersonic implies that Starship SN16's hypothetical flight test would reach a velocity of at least five times the speed of sound. Based on his comment, it's also safe to assume that Starship can reach hypersonic velocities under its own power, with three Raptor engines installed. Given that Musk also stated that Starship SN15 might launch a second time, but was then transported back to the factory, it's impossible to predict how likely SN16 will ever attempt a hypersonic flight test or fly at all. Recently a recorded address from SpaceX President Gwynne Shotwell to the graduating students of the Northwestern University teased the progress of building the Raptor engines that will power Starship's imminent orbital launch attempt. In a seemingly calculated move, the pre-recorded address included a glimpse of a screen on the factory floor, featuring a basic graphic depicting the aft ends of a Starship upper stage and super heavy booster. The display indicated that SpaceX has already shipped at least 11 of the 35 Raptor engines needed for the rocket's first launch attempt. This means that the SpaceX Hawthorne factory has already shipped almost a third of the engines required for Starship's inaugural orbital test flight. Those 11 engines most likely have left the factory and headed to the SpaceX McGregor test facility, where they will be tested on test stands before being cleared for flight. The display board also had a countdown clock indicating that something is supposed to happen within the next 25 days. Given the display's focus on engines shipped, the timer is likely counting down to an internal shipment target for the mission's 35th and final engine. If SpaceX hits that target and Shotwell's class address was recorded within the last week or so, all 35 orbital test flight Raptors could feasibly leave the factory floor by the end of the first week of July. It will take the engines a few weeks to finish qualification testing at McGregor before being shipped to Boca Chica. If SpaceX can clear all 35 Raptors for flight by the end of July, it's plausible that the orbital test flight of Starship could happen in August or September. On June 3, Save RGV, a nonprofit Texas organization that aims to promote the conservation of the natural areas of the county, sent a letter to Cameron County officials, saying SpaceX has exceeded the number of times it can make requests to close Highway 4 and Boca Chica Beach for rocket testing and launches. The organization has made a request that road closures cease for the rest of the year. The organization claims there are numerous violations of the Memorandum of Agreements, saying the closures have not been done with proper notice, and SpaceX has already exceeded its FAA-authorized 300-hour closure limit for 2021. After visiting Starbase and investigating the veracity of the complaint, on June 11, Cameron County officials sent a warning letter to SpaceX, mentioning that the company could be violating several state laws by shutting down public beaches for extended periods and using unlicensed security guards to ward people off public roads. The district attorney of Cameron County warned SpaceX that its actions could make the company and possibly its employees subject to arrest and prosecution. The letter also requests that SpaceX respond with a legal justification for its action by June 14, though it's not clear if SpaceX has responded. Moving on to Super Heavy updates, recently a stainless steel tank section that looks like the forward ring of Super Heavy Booster BN2 was spotted at the build site. The four holes on the sides of the ring appear to be the mounting points of booster grid fins. Lunar Caveman shared an illustration on Twitter that gives us a better understanding of the grid fin arrangement on super heavy boosters. Unlike the Falcon 9 grid fins, which are mounted at a 90 degree angle to each other, the super heavy grid fins will be mounted in a 60 and 120 degrees configuration. This type of grid fin arrangement will give maximum contact area with the tower arms, making it easier to catch the booster in mid-air. There are two protruding handles on opposite sides of the ring, which could be part of the booster catching mechanism. 
Elon Musk has previously mentioned that load points for the booster catching mechanism will be just below the grid fins. This makes it more likely that these clamps are the load bearing points on the booster. Meanwhile, inside the high bay, Super Heavy Booster BN2 received its aft dome section last week. All 35 Raptor engines of the booster will be attached to this section. With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week. Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.